And now this is on, this is the weird part that probably some people know that we are online. Well, I still don't know. So now they hear me talking in this stupid thing. Okay, welcome to uh, our session concerning environmental physiotherapy, um, mindfulness, the forest, the environment, with our guest speaker, Thies Bunsen, which is a great honor for me to introduce Thies Bunsen. He's a fellow executive board, board member of the Environmental Physiotherapy Association, and uh, he's one of the most inspiring person I know. Thies, up to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jos. Um, yeah. Um, I'm here today to have a good time with you and we're trying to connect some dots. So we fly over different things, but no, no worries. It's all connected. So um, I will start just by introducing myself here. So I'm Thies, as you said, and um, I started to study physiotherapy in the Netherlands in Enschede 2016. And last summer I finished and now I'm 26 and I live in Cologne and I'm working on some projects where we are trying to get nature-based concepts um, yeah, into um, people's lives. And we are working on an online um, program right now, what's about forest bathing um, that we want to get out soon. And we're also working on workshops to get the outdoors into daily lives and make it more accessible for people. And I'm also an executive member of the EPA, of the American Computer Therapy Association, but we'll be talking the, in the end a little bit about that as well. And um, let's start. So we we'll talk first about a little bit about creativity, and then we we'll talk about environmental awareness, how our senses can make a big change in our quality of life. And then I will be going to my thesis in the end and I hope we will have a little bit discussion after that. So um, why am I standing here? Um, I'm not sure, but I noticed that during my studies that I had a hard time focusing and I tried to find different environments all the time to get uh, like more information and to make sense of stuff. You could usually find me when it was sunny on the rooftops, trying to study on the garden, or I went to the parks or I took the book and went to the lake and I had, um, I think that I was better able to be focusing in this environment, but I also took in any, like, I looked at the things differently in a way that I was having the sunset next to me as well <laughs> and just taking moments there. And I, when, I, when I'm reflecting in the end, I think for some exams, for me, it really helped to have this calm mind that I think um, came mainly from the moments that I had in nature and that were actually the sunset maybe helping me for some exams to be more calm. And I remember that my supervisor in my last call when I presented my bachelor thesis um, told me that... Um, she, she knows a few, uh, few therapists who are creative. And she said, it's not easy to be a creative field therapist. And this was kind of surprising for me in the beginning because um, I didn't think of myself as being creative. And also I didn't make any music, I didn't make any art, just moving. Moving was something that I liked. I really love to move in different ways and I think that's kind of something that's maybe creative there. But um, yeah, I noticed quickly, there's one thing that I noticed quickly, <laughs> even though I'm not really thinking of this creativity stuff as part of me, that creativity was lacking in the therapy. So I don't know why, maybe time pressure, different things, but in general, I was thinking like, okay, there's no time here to kind of be creative and, on Sunday, I actually had a walk with a friend. We were in, in, in nature 
And she talked to me about creativity and she said her definition was creativity is the courage to look at things differently. And I'll just put this here into the camera. And for me, that was something that I've never thought about because it's not only when you make a song and you publish it or if you make a painting or, and you put it somewhere, that's creativity, but it's also to look at things differently and to have the courage to it. And I think, um, so that's quite important. And so I thought let's create something that will guide us to look at things differently in the future and reminds us to actually do that. And I hope each one of you has something in front of you, maybe paper, maybe a pen, and we can create a little card together that you can keep for yourself and you can also um, create it yourself. So um, when you now make a little frame, something like this on your, on your paper, you can um, on top, we have a name for this card and then underneath you describe just what you would like to do. And this is about exploring. So you kind of try to go in the outdoors, but you kind of invite yourself to do something there. So you can say, go for a walk and find a spot that you like, that you want to explore. Or you, for example, say you lay down somewhere and you look up in the sky something that you want to invite yourself to do to, to help you to look different at things. And you can also, as physiotherapists, we can also use our breath, take five deep breaths when, when we're at that spot. And the back of the card is also back to the card that you can create yourself. And that's about reflection. So when you look at things differently and out, um, after that you ask yourself how are you feeling now you can just check in with yourself and answer this question and what I think is quite interesting here to um, apply this in physiotherapy and maybe the borders that we have set over time um, that there's another question that I would like to reflect you on and that's imagine there would be no limitations to practice physiotherapy, how would you love to practice physiotherapy then? So I will just put this underneath as number two here. And that's what I just said. Imagine there would be no limitations to practice physiotherapy. How would you love to practice physiotherapy then? And if there are people here from other um, professions, you can put your profession in, you can. Also, if you're not from physiotherapy at all, you just put in how you would like to live your life if your life has no limitations. And I think this gives you something to think about, but first, um, just try to go somewhere. So take this card, any point in um, when you like to do that and try to do what you've written down and you can give it the name that you like so it's up to you. And yeah, so now we, I would like to jump into environmental awareness. And I think it's quite interesting um, where we spend most of our time. And now you in the inner circle can maybe also answer this question. What, are, what is one environment or building that you spend most of your time at the moment? Yes, when I, when I take, take, if you ask me where I spent most of my time, I think it's, strangely enough, it's indoors. Uh, it's within four walls. It's in a cubicle. It's a lot of the time around maybe, maybe already 80 hours a week. I think it's indoors. Yeah. And most of it's inactive. It's not engaged with the world. That would be my maybe the more. So if you if, if we put one um, bubble here, one environment, maybe one of them might be home, where we spend lots yeah. of time. Yeah. Exactly. And what's another one? Maybe 
that you spend most of your time? <laughs> I think for me, the most time I spend at school, um, if I look yeah. at my life, the, the biggest uh, time of the week, I'm, uh, I'm just at the home, also indoors. And I spend most of my time here. And then I will also put down here maybe uni then. And we already talked about work a little bit. So something, let's think of physiotherapy. We go to internships and we work in the clinic. And we have this other bubble here. That's the clinic. Uh, I hope you can read this. Yeah. And if you think now of maybe university and you're studying in the, in the library, um, when do you leave the bubble? For what? Um, I think I leave the bubble to get coffee. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> mostly coffee. <laughs> but That's only my only cue. Like you, but you go somewhere like out of the bubble then, but you, you go out of university or, or is it inside? Uh, out of university. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, I think at the end of the afternoon, afternoon just to go, go home, home. So I, I bike home. home. So, so I, I go from one bubble to the other. other. Yeah, but that's, that's also something like we always pass this environment here by maybe biking or with the car. And then we sometimes, as you said, we take coffee somewhere out there and we go back in, right? Yeah. And why do you take coffee? Um, yeah, I would say um, I need my, my coffee, coffee for concentration. concentration. And, and also, also, yeah, my concentration span is not, not very long. long. So once, once in a while, while to get out, to just, just yeah. refocus, 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 refocus. So maybe could call it a break, yes. some kind of a break, break here. So you need, okay. yeah. yeah, maybe you need the coffee. Um, maybe you need a break, break of the bubble that you're in. And there, then we have this bigger part. That's, um, I think now we talk about bigger environments than just the buildings. And we have all the space in between as well. And that's something that I would like to highlight. If you think of the break, um, when you study and you think of the break, usually the break gives you some more, some more energy and you can go back into the studies and you are back into concentration mode. And I think um, if we apply this now on, on, on bigger, bigger thinking, if, if people need more breaks um, and they, those breaks are out of those bubbles, how can we design them or how can we have them in, in the therapy? And I was thinking like people I think as well now you will be going to nature on a Sunday because of this lockdown that you're facing and you will be spending time here. You will be spending time here, spending time here, 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 and there. And this might be a break that you take from um, your bubble. So it could be that you, your body feels like, oh, I need a different environment. I need to change something. I need a break from my bubble. and this helps me actually to, to, to be more healthy or to feel, more, feel better. And for this, I think I would call it exploring. And I think exploring our environment is something what's really um, important in our lives and in environmental awareness. Because if you don't know what's out there, you cannot be aware of it. And we spend lots of time, I think 90% of our time we spent indoors that was some scientists said and um with that i think we don't explore as much as we used to when we were hunter gatherers and if we now think of the break and we um want to expand it we try to take this um, break longer and maybe go for a walk or go into the park and actually if we are out there we're not anymore in this environment where we usually focus a lot and we actually when we're in the library we don't want bird sounds and people that are running around and we try to only focus on one thing and our brain can do this for some time but then it needs regeneration it, it needs 
a refresher it needs something else to to fill up the battery and this is usually sensory information and we kind of distract ourselves or we shut down the sensory information during those times when, when we're concentrating and then when we for example go for go for the break and we go outside our body opens up our sensory um our senses and we can take in the environment again and we feel more connected and this is uh, something that i think is quite important to connect the dots and to make sense of the world around you so if you were here your body has created this map of your environment that you know okay if i don't feel that good i could maybe go from home to here spend some time here out there somewhere at the lake somewhere where you like to go in the in the environment and you um yeah can get in this sensory information and i think that's something also that is important for our lives now that our senses need to be sharpened um actually to make sense of our environment and i think we in health sometimes forgot for, forgot that a little bit that um our body feel safe when our senses are working and we can make sense of this stuff that's happening around us and usually when you go out here from your controlled environment from home somewhere else you feel like you go into uncertainty you don't know what's out there but that's what's called exploring and if you go out there your senses they activate and what you don't use you lose usually and if you're just sitting there and you're trying to concentrate all the time and you're trying to shut down your senses because you only want to concentrate you kind of don't develop those senses anymore and the sensory input from your ears maybe from, from your eyes as well it's not anymore um, working that that well so i would uh, like you then to think of this and let's go to our senses and how um important our sensory input is that we're getting because it can make quite a difference if you get different sensory inputs and i'm focusing mainly here now on extra reception we have interoception as well which is the sensory information from our organs from our internal body and some other stuff and then we have also proprioception from our body i think we know quite good in physiotherapy but um then we have also our eyes and we have our smell our our hearing and we have our tactile sense of making sense of the world by touching and we have also our taste and those senses sometimes i feel are a little bit um lacking in the focus of our physiotherapy um or in health as, as in, in general and this is something that we need to make sense of the world so we make sense of stuff by actually interacting with it so i would like to just give you a quick um insight here into something i learned in functional neurology and that was about sensory input um and we are getting sensory input and this is processed processing and then we get motor output so exactly um so what we're getting here is for example something that we mm, get from the outside so if you think of the therapy you have a patient and you didn't tell him that you're going to touch his knee and he's also not looking there but at some point you're touching his knee and he's feeling the, the 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 touch there the sensory input and what happens with his brain the brain is asking um or this information is going to the brain to so sensory neurons and it's asking is it safe so it's like um thinking like memory do i know the therapist 
do I, did I, did my eyes see something or did I knew that before? Did he tell me? And maybe the brain says, no, you have no information from that. You will react like um, this. And this is the motor output than what you're getting because your senses didn't give you as much information that they needed to make a good decision or to, to actually, yeah, just be calm and just like relax. And like, I know who that is. I know my, my eyes are watching this and it's, it's all, it's all safe. And yeah. And then for my thesis now, I was thinking, um, yeah, what, and because I was thinking about chronic health problems and mainly I noticed that they don't feel so safe. They feel less safe. And I was thinking, okay, how is that? And I was now looking at um, our evolution and what maybe happened back in the days when we were really stressed. And we were, for example, just imagine we were running away from a tiger really, really fast, really fast. We're running, running, running. And tunnel vision kicks in and we are in, in reactivating our sympathicus. Um, and at some point, also the brain says, it's totally safe to run, 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 run. So running, running, only running. And then we are in safety again and we maybe the, we are faster than the tiger. And what happened then is quite important because I think we usually forget that there is something that happens after this, this stress that we have. Um, that this person was probably somewhere in the savannah, somewhere in the forest, somewhere in nature, and was lying or leaning against the tree. Just like, like wall, walls are also there to lean on, <laughs> but trees are better, I would say. But anyways, if you hear, you can take in the environment around you, you actually open your senses again. If you're in the stress response and you're like running, 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 you close up your senses, you have tunnel vision. And then after that, you want to check the environment again and check what's around you. And this checkup really tells the brain, is it safe now? And you're checking everything with your senses and then the body says, yes, it's safe. We can move on, we can calm, we can relax. And I think this is something that I, that made me also think about those environments that maybe give us sensory input that's of good quality and that opens up our senses. And this is not usually not the bubbles that we're living in, but the outdoors. And I was thinking in my bachelor thesis that I want to improve the quality of life of people with chronic health problems. So I want to improve the quality of life down here by doing something up here. So something I want to give in the system of our body, of our brain, that this is changing in the end. And I think that we need to think global global on this because if you have more um, vision you can also move better in life so you can also interact with your muscles better and it's not always the local stuff that we're working on and that has an impact on the local stuff that we're working on but if we improve the senses you can move better in life and we know better what's around you and yeah so that was now my goal to think of which environment provides quality sensory input that lets us feel more safe. Um, so just for you to read. And how can a patient now explore this for, for himself? So I will be going through my, to my thesis now. And let's think of how this can be explored by a patient. Mm. So when I'm thinking of um, in my thesis, it was a case study that I was doing last year in September. And um, no, it's actually 
2019 in September. So already on one, one and a half years ago. And I investigated if the nature-based homework program that I was developing um, improves the quality of life of a patient with chronic health problems. And the um, nature-based homework program, I will explain in a moment. The patient that I had there was a patient with multiple, multiple sclerosis. Um, she was 33 and a female, and she had us already for 10 years. And had half a year ago, she had a big relapse and she was on sick leave, so she was not working anymore. She went to rehab as well, but she was still worrying um, if, if she can ever work again as uh, she wasn't able to help herself. So she said that she was mostly at home and um, nothing of the stuff that she was doing until then with the therapy was really, really helping her in a way that she um, is less stressed. She thought that she was getting more and more stressed. And yeah, so the, the program, we started to, um, yeah, to first make a smart goal with her. And this was for the for, for eight weeks. So for eight weeks in total, we were doing this and we started with patient education then as well. And we were talking about the, the brain and the senses and how this makes sense to be integrating with nature health benefits. So how um, actually this can have an impact on stress, what um, nature provides us. And yeah, so the nature-based homework program that we did was something that I was giving her for homework. So I had 20 cards, something similar than you just did before. Um, you were doing this little card for yourself and we were giving it a name. We were describing what she, well, in, or like inviting her to do something in a, good way of communication, really calm, really just inviting her to do this task, something maybe try to find a tree that's lying somewhere and try to balance on. And then in the end, the, the back, there was something for reflection. Um, how far have you gotten this time or how do you feel doing this? And then we were doing also different stuff with our eyes, with, of course, of hearing, um, stuff of closing your eyes and moving and how this impacts your movement. So um, different stuff that you can try in the, in the forest and also about finding, finding spots in the forest that you like the most. And so exploring the environment is actually. And those 20 cards that I had, um, I didn't gave her all of them or told her to do one thing and um, it was about something between us that she decides which card she likes the most. So there were 10 cards that she, I told her to, to choose. And she said, that was really good that you did that because um, if for example, there was one card where it was about hugging a tree. And she said, if I would have done this in the beginning or if I had to do this, I would have quit because this is nothing I, I'm, I'm doing but after four weeks she was totally fine doing it and just um yeah told me like after four weeks i was okay so then i choose to take to take this card and do it so she kind of controlled it in in her way the the, the, the pace of the therapy and next to this um i gave her a book something like this just um, with empty pages where she could reflect, which she could take into the forest, where she can write in, where she can put stuff in as well, whatever she wanted. And I told her that nothing I will, I will, not, nothing of it you will need to show me, but if you like, you can. So it's also voluntarily. And yeah, that was the homework that she was doing. And that was about five walks during the week for at least 20 minutes and trying to do one card um, at this walk. And she, she lived quite close to the forest show, so, and she had also lots of time, so she didn't have that much problems implementing this. 
um, just just so you know. So there was not no nobody who was in the middle of the city. There was somebody in a village. And then also in physical therapy, during the sessions we had it once a week, um, um, for forty minutes. And the first twenty minutes, we I, I choose to do a re reflection session, where we were just talking about the experiences that she had, and also about implementation strategies or if she needs advice how how she can fit this in the day, um, and also about just stuff that she wanted to tell me so i was really there to listen for those 20 minutes and trying to empower her and understand her and actually making a good relationship with her there because i think also in those um with those patients sometimes we don't have much support from 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 relationships in, in their environment and it's really important to to just um, have a good relationship with the physical therapist and also that she can tell her stories and then i also asked her in the, in the end always if she notices some changes already if she feels something is changing and yeah that was about the reflection and then we went into physical therapy um, after that for 25 minutes in germany usually 20 minutes <laughs> we have the um, physical therapy session and we went into gate stability most of the time. So we were working on gait steadiness and increasing that, um, which she said also was quite good to actually um, do this because she could implement this in her walk quite well. Um, yeah. And then um, we did qualitative interviews. We also did quantitative measures. But I will not go into them right now. They're also interesting, but you can see them in the blog post, which is in the comments um, right here. If you want to read more of it, um, there's something about my thesis as well. So there's more information. But in the qualitative interviews that we done, we also interviewed the supervisor. And he said, the physiotherapist so the, that I was there with, he said that the focus on the environment gives the patient the feeling of doing something valuable for their health, regardless of how they execute it. So here we go. And I think that's quite interesting because in exercise that we give patients, it's, it's also possible that they feel that they're doing something good, but sometimes it's about the execution part that people don't really know how to execute the exercise. And they think, okay, I'm doing good or I'm doing bad or am I hurting myself or I'm not sure I'm not so um, secure in that. And people are, are sometimes afraid and cannot really implement it. And in the forest, it, it's something that the forest catches your attention and there is nothing wrong or bad when you listen to birds. This is just, um, you cannot do something wrong there. You just, you can do something wrong if you put your music in, of course, not wrong, but um, birds are just there. So um, there's not much use yourself you need to do just to be aware of it. And also it's about not feeling judged. So just simple, simple about this, a tree cannot judge you, right? It, it cannot say, something to you it's just that there's a connection maybe but it's not about judging um, as you sometimes may maybe feel it when you go to a shopping mall and you feel like okay good or bad this is th this is how i should look like the tree is not telling you this so um there's opportunity there and then when there's another quote that she then told me um as soon as you interact with the forest, you also deal with other things about how you can make your life better and healthier. So as soon as you interact with the forest, you can yeah, you can read it here, exactly. And I think this is about behavior change and that if you give the patient different sensory input that we were having here as well, sensory input, different inputs, people are, going to change some stuff and she said that she was trying out more yoga classes for example she was also cooking more vegetables which was quite interesting and 
she said as well that she can rely on her senses now, that she feels like you can rely on her senses and that the forest walk helps her to relieve her headaches. And it's actually helps her more than taking a pill for the headaches. And I think something like here, motor output is also headaches, pain. And if you change the sensory input by maybe giving like going into the forest in the environment, you can have an impact on, for example, headaches. And this, mm, this is what she also, also mentioned there. And exactly. So yeah, one thing that I also really liked <laughs> what she said, um, that she was also there was an exercise where she had, had to be grateful for the for the forest to be there. And she said, if I'm grateful in the evening for the forest, I cannot go in the next day into the supermarket and buy plastic bags. So she said, I will choose paper bags because the forest gives me such like gives me something. I want to not destroy it or not actually yeah, be a little bit more environmental there. And then I want to go on to the next one, next quote. And that's one is this one. Um, now that I make it up to two hours through the forest without any problems, I go to the disco on evenings again. And that's something that I was really surprised of. Um, I think she told me about five weeks into the program that she really. Um, like goes to the disco again, which she was not doing for, I think she said one year or something like that. And um, again, here, I think it's, yeah, different parts. Of course, the, the gate stability was something that we were um, increasing by walking through the forest, by having the challenges in the forest as well, that she said, and she felt way much safer, safer by walking and, being out outside again and the thing that she was actually more with people now she was going to the to the disco from actually being alone at home um i would like to explain quickly here with a little model that's called set it's called the supportive environmental supportive environment theory and this is something that it's also explained in my blog post, and it's from Bankson and Quran in 2014. It's a study, but you can check this up in the resources in my blog post in the comments. And um, in, in, in this triangle, um, if you really feel high well-being, you are up here, and when you really feel low well-being, you are down down here and you need usually in, in this low when you are low well-being you need um something like this we're talking about environments that then can you support you here let's think of of a tree of environments that you can sit on lean on and you can think of environments that is like a river like water elements you can think of stones and this is more inward engagement they say and up here you have outward engagement and that's something where you may be the leader and other people follow what you're doing and you are doing like a sports course and you are leading or you here maybe that's more the disco example that you are active participating with other people again and I just want now to make this uh, make sense of it. It's I think it's about relationships that we are building with different environments. And there are simple relationships that you can build with um, elements of nature, with stones and water and trees and like other elements. And they are placed down here when you have low well-being you can find stability and safety in those environments that are simple, just really simple and easy to communicate, interact with. 
And she said as well that she really liked on really bad days to touch nature, to like be in touch with nature and actually touch the tree. And that made her feel good. And I think that's something that maybe is um, described here. And when you're down here in this environment, you can move up the ladder to go up here and to be more high well-being. And then also what you need then is you need interaction with people. This is something I don't want to tell. Everybody has to go back to nature and we have to stay there. That's good. But we need interaction. We need to have relationships and those need to be of good quality. And if you really seek quality environments, you have to go into like those simple relationships and then you can go also up there. After that, again, and be out there with people and humans and um, yeah. So I will go with my last quote here and that's, there's rarely a day when I don't go into the forest because I feel like my body really calls for it. And she said that as well in the end, that, yeah, there's rarely a day when I don't go into the forest because I feel like my body really calls for it. And if you now want to, um, yeah, if you comment on this or if you have other thoughts or questions, I'm open for that. Dies, thank you so much. Well, you got us. Uh, yeah, it was really interesting. So, just have the floor for the others. So, who has something to? I do. Yes, please. Um, there. Because I, I really like the idea. Um, but how would you implement this in a big city um, when a person is not able to um, go into nature or go into a forest um, for whatever reason? How would you do that then? Um, so. If we're thinking of people that are not um, like they're just in a city, I mean, there's also people that maybe are in the in a wheelchair or they really cannot access nature. But if you think of people in the city, I think it's not needed to go um, every day into nature. Mm -hmm. You can also just go on the weekend, what um, just for longer. And this is also has big health benefits and i didn't go into the health benefits here because i kind of wanted to make understand why we need to change environments but if you are out there for one whole day on a sunday you will increase your um killer cells in your body your white blood cells by 40 percent if just being out there in nature for one day and this is uh, actually holding on for one for one whole week after that so you don't have to go every day to have those um insights but then i think also in the city you find parks you find different spots and i think something that we always don't recognize even when you're in the city there's still the sun and there's still the sky that's also nature so if if we take our head up and we look up into the sky and there are clouds there's also something to change our environment just by different movement of our head or looking at things different maybe in addition, I was just thinking, and I don't know if you read it on the, uh, the Moving Earth blog on the Environmental Physiotherapy website, there was also the, the blog post written by Pamela, uh, mm -hmm. Pamela Kipps Hansford um, from, from South Africa, in which she wrote, uh, Beyond Independence Lies in the Dependence. This kind of the story, what actually is there when it starts to come, because you're asking, Stere, now it's when it's impossible to go into nature, because... The, Otherwise, nature is long gone, or people have kind of disabilities, which doesn't make it. But she provides different perspectives, and it might also be that you have in, in help or within a kind of interdependence what you can do. So I will, put, I will put the link also in the show notes so that people can find it. Any other parts of comments or questions? Um, yes. So... Firstly, um, this fits wonderful to the many of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and as well to the Global Action Plan for Physical Activity. So wonderful. And um, I was thinking, how do you, what do you advise physiotherapists to start with integrating um, more of the environment into their daily practice? Mm, yeah, 
it's a good question because I think that's something that we always forget to to take time for ourselves. So it's for me it starts all by just um, like living the lifestyle that you show others or that you want to give to others. So if you start by yourself first and then trying to develop this connection and you explore and then you will probably find ways to manage this also in physiotherapy and maybe get the motivation and the, the, the authenticity to, to stand for your vision that you may be developing in this time by practicing it yourself, trying to go out in nature. But um, for me as well, I, I was struggling because my thesis, I wanted to actually work outside. I wanted to be outside as well, but it was not really possible in Germany because we, um, yeah, with the insurance, I think there's problems to go with the patient outside if you don't have a private garden or something. And so I developed a homework program. So um, yeah, I think actually in homework programs, we have quite a potential, a potential because also it makes the patient and self efficacy how would you say, like, yeah, self efficacy So you um, can do it your, on your own and you do, can do it in your environment and you're not dependent on the physiotherapist. So if we have more time during our practice of physiotherapy to talk about homework programs or homework programs and reflect with the, with the, with the patient, I think we can actually make them um, have fun doing the homework programs as well. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. You, want to say, you want to add something? I, I want to do, thank you, but I was a bit um, dealing with the unmute. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Julien, I think that Julien, you want to ask uh, or you add something? Yeah. Um, so after studying this, did you change um, something by yourself? Um, I think now also pre um, preparing for the for the um, presentation, I I was actually looking back and I understood way way better what I was doing. So I think I'm still studying it <laughs> and somehow and trying to understand what I was doing because I, I I was not I was kind of aware of this, but I was not aware of this. Of this of the, of the quotes that I was getting, like the the results, I was not aware that she's going to change mm -hmm. uh, in cooking style and uh, trying to do vegetables. Uh, but um, for myself, I think the main thing that I changed now was to look in the sky more often. Just any time when I'm outside, I think I'm also I'm walking maybe also more like this. But I, it's like people out there, I think. People often look more down, and I notice now how nice it is to look in the sky. <laughs> I think that's sense, something I changed. Not, not in front, but putting the senses all, all over, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Have you um, used it with other patients already? Um, no, I'm actually, I did my thesis. And then we were trying to do, or we, uh, we already did a workshop there for, for, for one, for 10 people, like during a whole day. And um, we're trying to do this, um, but um, I, I, through my internships, I gave some of my cards that I had to some patients, mm -hmm. like two or three of them, but I didn't do the whole program again. No, not yet. Okay. If there are no questions, I would talk a bit about the Environmental Physiotherapy Association. Please do. Just, just quickly. Okay. Um, so this is also in the comments in, in, in YouTube and you can click on it and you can um, find information. But if you want to support this kind of development, um, you can go to the Environmental Physiotherapy Association and you can join us for free. Um, we are an international color, a community of different people we are um, and everybody who's interested in, in exploring and advancing this this field of environmental physiotherapy 
And it's really about a, like everybody, somebody for animal physiotherapy is uh, open to, to join us, somebody from architecture or anybody who's interested. So we really want to exchange and find ideas. And yeah, and we think it's physiotherapy always takes place on a planetary scale and that physiotherapy, in physiotherapy, we have the potential to make a valuable contribution to planetary health as well. And that the limits we have set ourselves are, um, yeah, just limits that we have set ourselves. <laughs> and yeah, so you're happy to join us, contact us, find resources on our webpage and read the blog post. They're really interesting. And then we have one more project, what we have done last year. That's the EPT Agenda 2023. And for all of you students out there, it's about um, field therapy education. And you can sign it. So you can just sign it and just like express your support for it or that you are um, thinking that this is a good idea to have more education in this kind of direction of connecting the relationship between uh, the environment, human health and functioning um, yeah, into the therapy. So just have a read there and feel free to always contact me as well. You find all my information on the blog post. It's also in the comments again, the link. And start the conversation about this. I think it's really important to start the conversation with your teachers, with patients as well, what they like. We should not exclude them, include them, ask them when you're in internships. <laughs> how about nature? What is nature for you? And stuff like that. And yeah, if you look for help with your thesis and you find resources as well. And on the yeah, on our Environmental Physiotherapy Association website. And now to finish up, I would like to tell you that there's a summary of my talk just out there. And that's when you put this into YouTube, you will find um, a, mu a music video, but it's about two minutes. And that's from Tom Rosenthal. And it's uh, called, You Might Find Yours. So just everybody who wants to put it down in your notes, just look at this music video after. And it's yeah, Tom Rosenthal, you might find yours. It's, I'm quite glad that he put it out. I think it's quite a good summary of my talk. And for the, for the end now, I want to thank you for listening. And... Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, Sterre, would you take it over? I have to go to another meeting. Uh, Sterre and uh, Hanneke is now the host. So that's one You're more question done. from out. It's really nice. So it's not really done. So we have to continue this one. Yes. All right. Okay. Then, then Thank you very on. much. Steve. So please, you can continue and I go to another meeting and we will talk soon. Thank you so much for your wonderful meeting. Thank you, Jos. Uh, I saw a question. Um, on uh, the YouTube comments um, mm -hmm. that I found really interesting. Um, it said, would the benefits of contact uh, with nature still affect our patients if they'd start with digital encounters uh, with nature, such as listen listening to sounds of the rain and birds uh, with their eyes closed? So a bit more visualization um, maybe. Yeah, def definitely. Um, and when I look now back onto, onto my thesis, I um, remember that she in the end said that she is actually, even when she's at work, she was thinking of the forest sometimes by just thinking of the moments or looking out the window and thinking what she experienced and saying herself, it's, it's all fine, it's okay. And I think that visualization is a big, big part that we can also explore. <laughs> and it's like such as our environment. And also when I think of this in, in clinics and hospitals, I think there's big potential to, to change the environment in a way that people have nature sounds that um, they maybe get, yeah, as she, as she said, um, sounds 
that you can, I mean, everybody knows those sounds that you can go and look at on, on YouTube or on your phone to, to calm down and relax. And that's pretty much the same, but not the same in total. I mean, I think you know, I know what I'm saying. Like, it's it's good to, and when you're in those environments and you have no other, other chunks, it's better than nothing. And it really actually has also a good effect. But, um, yeah, it's maybe, not... Uh, maybe something with Sorry to interrupt, but we have to oh, end the meeting for Joost to start a new meeting. Um, so maybe... Um, we can just right. uh, send these the, the questions we have and he can answer them maybe by email or uh, go to the wonder yeah and you can I go will. to the wonder me um which is also on the website and you can just talk to each other there so thank you uh Tish. and sorry okay for yeah like this <laughs> thanks thanks for